You're listening to Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. I'm Lisa Birnbach, and this is Five Things That Make Life Better. My guest today is the award-winning journalist, Nancy Jo Sales. I've been reading her pieces for a long time, particularly her profiles in Vanity Fair, and she's written a new book, which is a memoir, which is also an essay that she's reported. It's called Nothing Personal, My Secret Life in the Dating App Inferno. And Nancy Jo has been an expert on the Ute and how they use social media, and how she uses social media is both juicy and disturbing. The book is published by Hachette and it will be coming out next week. My usual weekly thoughts and reactions to our times in my life have been disrupted this week. A dear friend who I've known since we were teenagers has entered hospice care after years of dealing with a grave disease. My thoughts are with her and her family. I've been able to visit with her and them, for which I feel deeply privileged but it puts everything else into a vague fuzz. Her beautiful family is handling their fears and grief so well and with so much love and courage. And what else is there after all but courage and love? Meanwhile, I've been sidelined by a relatively minor health situation, and I've spent more time in medical offices this week than I have at my desk. I am fine and I will be fine, but I just haven't paid that much heed to what is going on in the world. In between appointments, though, I hear of these new shootings every day. What's going on? I wish America were better than that. And it makes me think maybe we really are two Americas now. Maybe that's what it's come to. The one with the guns, which you could compare to the Huns, and the other America with, I don't know, NPR tote bags. I know that sounds glib, but it does seem like the moment enough of us had been vaccinated that we could return to the marketplace, the first cultural activity that made it back was killing people. Maybe I should just take a painkiller and shut up. Well, while we think about that, here are my five things that make life better. Number one, medical insurance. Okay, I have the luxury of it. I have it. I have specialists good doctors, I get tests. And I know there are so many Americans who don't have this kind of access. At this point, most of my body parts have their own doctors, which is very nice for all of them. And I'm grateful for them. But I'm hoping within the next year, more everyday Americans will be able to have improved insurance and won't have to choose between food, rent, and medicine. That's just not humane. Number two, the sourdough bread my friend Fred has introduced me to at Winter in Brooklyn. I will say no more, as the line to buy this bread is already long enough. Number three, digital book tours. That's what keeps this podcast fed. I know authors would rather meet their readers and interviewers in person, go to sign books where they can actually touch their book and so on. But for now, this is how it works. And a podcast or a webinar can just be much more intimate sometimes than a live reading. Number four, an old leather coat I have in the back of my front hall closet. I haven't worn it in at least a year and a half. Let's be honest, I haven't gone anywhere in a year. But as much as I try to clean out my closets, I often find I give away the very thing I should have kept. I'm ashamed to say I got rid of a classic Burberry trench coat years ago. What was I thinking? Or was I thinking? Why would you get rid of that? So I saw a picture of a chic black leather coat today online, and I thought, oh, I'd like to have that coat. And then I remembered that I have something so similar to it, which now I will hold on to. Number five, New York City's endless, wait for it, scaffolds. I hate them. I love them. I hate them. But I love them because they are great when you're walking a dog in the rain. The scaffolds block so much light and they block so much architectural interest from the streets. But yet, on a day like today, a lot of rain, they are a godsend. And underneath the scaffolds are like mini dog parks 
But seriously, though, real estate companies, can't you just do the repairs already and we'll figure out another way to protect our dogs in the rain? Coming up, the writer who is also a dating app expert and user, Nancy Jo Sales. Don't go away. Nancy Jo Sales is a writer I always wanted to meet, never thought it would take this long, but I'm glad that her book, Nothing Personal, My Secret Life in the Dating App Inferno, uh, I'm glad that the book came along to make this introduction happen. You're such a wonderful writer, Nancy Jo. Welcome to my podcast. Thank you very much. You have become an expert on the youth of America. You have become an expert in how they communicate. And little did you think, I suppose, that you would end up being a guinea pig for yourself in the inferno of dating apps. That's right. That's absolutely right. You go back and forth between your own story in this book and also your reporting on what was happening with um, social mores and connecting and hooking up and so on. When did you decide that you wanted to tell your story along with a narrative about what was happening to other people? I did a documentary film for HBO in 2018. I directed and produced a film called Swiped, Hooking Up in the Digital Age. And when it came out, I started to get lots of emails and all kinds of DMs and things from young women who wanted to share their experiences with me. And this was not anything new. Um, this has been, you know, the case all along since I've been writing about kids and social media that wanting to reach out to someone because very often this, these things are not publicly expressed in, a, in an era when we think that we are so open. You know, there are certain things that are, are still taboo to talk about. And I don't necessarily mean sex, but it's more like the way that women are treated on platforms, the things that guys do and say. It's become sort of like, you know, you're not a cool girl if you complain or if you think that there's anything untoward about this or that. This is how it was at least two years ago. I think we've had some movement away from that, which is good, away from it being taboo. So I felt like even though I had done this film, I still had more that I wanted to share and I really wanted to tell them. And I so often want to tell my young women friends. I have a lot of young women friends in their 20s and 30s. You're not alone in feeling this way. I went through it too. I know exactly what you're talking about because the same things happened to me. And I'm here to tell you as someone who's 30 years older than you or more, this is not okay. This is not right. This isn't what we should be accepting as the norm. And the normalization of dating culture via apps and different sites is really threatening to, I I think, our sense of well-being and um, happiness, the ability to find a long-term relationship. And so I really wanted, as I was always doing, you know, in private with my young women friends or with sources off camera or off tape recorder or whatever, I wanted to say to them, look, (laughs) this isn't you. It's not, you you know, that old, old expression, Mm, like, it's not, it's not you, it's me. No, it's not you. It's this. It's them. It's this. How did you manage to get addicted to swiping? I'm sure there must have been a point at which you said to yourself, Nancy Joe, this, you know, you can control this, you can control this, you're, you're the expert here. And yet, I'm asking you as a person who hasn't swiped how it happens, how it slowly takes over. How I got addicted is that the design is very powerfully and purposefully designed to be addictive. And, mm-hmm. and if you watch Swiped, I even got Jonathan Bedeen who invented this swipe mechanic. He's the co-founder of Tinder. At the time, he was the COO of Tinder, and he's in my film. And he, he said very openly, and I would say even proudly, that, yeah, oh, yeah, we, we designed this to be addictive. And it's sort of like a slot machine or any kind of gambling machine where, you know, there's bells and whistles that you wanting to do it more and more and more. And this is one of the more insidious aspects of these platforms because what winds up happening is that people – you know, it's it's social conditioning, which the it's founders... Pavlo- it's Pavlovian. Yes. Right. Yes. And so what happens is, okay, so what does it feel like as a person doing it? 
if you've never done it, what it feels like is you can probably compare it to how you, not you personally, but how someone who has never used a dating app feels about Instagram or about Twitter or any other of these platforms which are designed in the same ways to get you addicted is that you start thinking about it more than seems normal. Mm -hmm. You want to go back to it. Your hand twitches to pick it up. You might think about it very first thing when you open your eyes. That's when I really started to realize, oh my God, they've done something to my brain because I would open my eyes and reach my phone and go on one of these apps. Okay, Cupid or Tinder, whatever. And I think this is the case for a lot of people. I think that recognizing this in yourself is one of the first steps towards being able to analyze the whole situation of being on a dating app. When you really think about the fact that you can't stop doing it, then I think it's a, a doorway to talking about the whole enterprise of it. This was too, when I went on, it was 2014, and that's when these things really first started to gain steam. Um, I had interviewed kids about it, and I was already aware of it, had written about it and everything. The first person who told me about Tinder was a 16-year-old girl in Los Angeles. She took it out of her purse. I said, Tinder? What's Tinder? She told me she was just going to, like, you know, go. She had had her heart broken. I'm just going to go meet a guy and lose my V on Tinder. And I said, what's Tinder? And she said, oh. What's V? No, I got it. (laughs) Whatever. So, you know, so she takes this thing out of her purse. And she starts showing it to me. And she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it wasn't just people her age she was talking to. These were like 30-something-year-old men, some of them. Right. And I can't say directly and definitively that because of that piece that Tinder changed it so that you're not allowed to go on it if you're under 17 or 18 or something. But they did change it after that. However, it's still the case that kids still go on these things, you know, because I just, I have a dating app and rape and sexual assault alert on my Google alerts on my phone. And I was just reading yesterday, it wasn't Tinder, it was another app, a 13 year old girl was raped on a dating app date. And Mm -hmm. um, they go on because they do fake profiles through Facebook, and they get on and they're talking to people and it's not, it's not safe. And these things just happen. So I saw looking at this thing saying, Oh, my God, this is going to change everything. This is this is going to change everything. And I'd already seen OkCupid and whatnot on a computer, but it's very different when it's on the phone. And it was very different because of the swipe mechanic. The swipe mechanic seemed to me to be something that was going to have a huge impact on our society. And I think when they write the book on like history of the internet, there will be a few things that they will say were milestone moments. And one was the invention of the like, and one one would be the swipe. The swipe. Yeah. So a couple of things to react to what you've just said. The irony of the term dating app when dating is something that is so abhorrent to especially millennial guys who are amongst the biggest users of this format. Also, the irony that this isn't about dating. It's about casual sex. It's about a quick one-nighter or a quickie. The language hasn't changed as quickly as our habits have. Would you agree? Yes. And dating has changed because of not just dating apps, but the whole internet, right? I mean, it's, it's just become right. very different. And I do think hookup culture and dating apps are intertwined. However, there's also an aspect of dating apps that that's like people just use them for quote unquote entertainment. Again, I think it's this addiction thing. They're not even really intending to ever meet up with someone. Mm-hmm. They're just, you know, you get this it, dopamine. Yeah, you get this dopamine rush just from being matched with. And you have these sort of pointless conversations that go nowhere with a stranger. It sort of momentarily assuages loneliness, but actually I think long-term, and studies bear this out, exacerbates loneliness because you're not actually having any real kind of connection with someone. The hookup sex does happen. I definitely experienced a lot of that myself. Mm -hmm. But um, what's also happening is that dating and sex are different. It's not the same in the sense that you intend to really connect with this person. It might just be that, you know, I, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say on your podcast, but uh, I'm going to try and say it in a, in a delicate way. So pleasuring oneself during the so-called meeting on the app, right? It might just be enough for some people, especially the guys, right? It was very fascinated when you started taking these apps on test runs yourself both how you were so honest about how you weren't even enjoying your encounter with somebody, with the skateboard guy, 
You oh, it was terrible. It was terrible. terrible. <laughs> but yet you went you went through with it because in a way it's just as easy to finish off as it is to send him away. Or maybe easier. Well, I don't think I'm the first woman who's experienced that, you know? I mean, it's definitely something that I think many women do experience, which is that, you know, you're not really getting what you had hoped for out of this encounter, but you did consent to it as you're in the middle of it. And so it's just sort of like, okay, but there's not, you don't know the person really very well. And there's not necessarily a whole lot of attention paid to you as a person. Um, either physically or emotionally. And it feels very alienating and it's not great. And so this idea that you're going to go on this dating app and have this racy, exciting adventure, well, that's not impossible. That happened to me too sometimes. But the majority of the time, it was just bad. Like yeah. a, a girl in my film, actually, excuse me, I, I apologize for saying that a trans woman in my film says hookup sex is bad, you know, just bad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is really the case for a lot of people out there. I mean, just think about it. So you're addicted to this thing that's going to get you either if you're a woman, basically used as a prop, an, an object for somebody to jack off to, or you're going to have sex with someone who doesn't really know you and doesn't really care about like having some wonderful time with you physically. And yet you're addicted to it. So it's, uh, I think, rather than being this empowering thing, as the marketing teams of big dating want to tell us, it's really quite the opposite. Yeah. I mean, that's what I came away with. Also, the fact that so many guys who approached you would talk about rape as if it were something you were really hoping for. That well, was a shock to me. I mean, using the word in a way that would be sort of, what did they think it was going to be sexy? It's funny because we're in this Me Too moment. We're having a reckoning about rape and sexual assault across industries and in families. And yet rape, the word rape has never been more normalized as a thing to say and throw around on the internet and on social media platforms than it ever was. I think whatever you think about the phrase rape culture, I mean, then what do you have to say about the fact that almost every woman I know has it some, especially people who are outspoken or visible in some way, has been met with some comment or, or commentary or something involving the word rape. I just interviewed a, a 16 year old girl, very big TikToker named Sissy Sheridan. I did a piece for Airmail on her rise to fame and how the comments that she gets as a 16 year old girl on TikTok are sometimes really really aggressive and abusive and involve the word rape. And I, mm. I think that any, any woman or girl who's been on the internet knows exactly what this is about, has experienced this. And yes, I did. I, I mean, they would say, you know, guys would say horrible things and all my sources and my young women friends tell me like, that's how I first heard about it was from my sources and, and friends. And they would show me, they would show me on their phones to say, look at what this guy said to me on OkCupid or whatever. And it would just be these horrible things. And nobody was talking about it. Nobody was writing about it. Mainstream media was saying, oh, this is really great that what the kids are doing. They're like using these fun apps to go on dates and hook up. Meanwhile, nobody was really talking about in mainstream media that there was a whole lot of harassment, abuse, non-consensually shared nudes, all this kind of stuff. Well, in the early days of the internet, I remember stories from my children's schools about nude pictures that had been sent between, I guess, a girl and a boy. The boy had asked for it. The girl had complied, but had said, please don't show this to anyone else. The boy said, of course not, and then promptly shared it with his best friend who shared it out. And because the schools were so small, the communities were so small, the girls were shamed and ridiculed and parents were understandably devastated and wanted to protect their kid. And the girls always had to leave the school. The boys never did. Exactly. This is something that I covered in my, my last book, American Girls, Social Media and the Secret Lives of Teenagers. I didn't go I went all over the country to 10 states, interviewing hundreds of girls, and not a single girl that I spoke to who hadn't had some incident in her own life or in her school that is similar to what you just described. You know, people are, are, right. are finally reacting against what this is doing to people and doing to our lives. But um, 
early on, this this just wasn't the case. And there would just be, I, I really felt that this muting of women's experience online was itself a form of misogyny. Mm -hmm. Basically, if I can be so simplistic, the internet, which is fantastic in so many ways, you can do research so easily, you don't have to walk to a library, you can find things at your fingertips, but it has also created in its efficiency a kind of really bad scenario for females. It has created a situation in which STDs go up, marriage rates go down, loneliness goes up, suicide goes up, anxiety goes up. It's not all of the internet, and maybe it's not only about dating apps, but boy, oh boy, if I had to go to high school during the internet age, I don't know how I would have done. Well, I think you, you know, you just pretty much summarized my last book. That's exactly what it's about. And um, that was five years ago. And I don't see that things have gotten better. I think they've only gotten worse with TikTok. With dating apps, you see with this new book and my own personal experiences on it, it's, um, I'm, I am talking about myself because I don't want anyone to think that I am in any way, I don't think that I've ever done this in my work, but with this book, I'm really putting myself out there because I mm -hmm. want people to know I am in no way judging anybody for their experience. I think we're all being exploited and manipulated by these companies. I think the dating apps are have just been terrible for women, just unquestionably bad for women. And yet, even in TechLash, even when we're now talking about, gee, Facebook got Donald Trump elected. I mean, one could argue. Mm -hmm. And Mark Zuckerberg, according to AOC, sits down with right-wing groups that you know have pages on Facebook all of this really, really disturbing stuff. And yet it's still not okay to criticize dating apps. I mean, like generally and broadly. And I think that that's because journalists in the main, more like editors at publications who tend to be older white men are afraid of looking old. And they're afraid of looking like they don't get what the kids are up to, you know, and oh, they, yes, that makes sense. They mm -hmm. just kind of go with whatever the Forbes, you know, well, yeah, Tinder, yeah, but look how much money they're making. Yeah. Look at look at how that, what that, that company's valued at now. And they're not thinking because they don't have to about what it's doing to women's lives and also girls. You say in the book that you hope your daughter doesn't read the book. Um, how old is she? <laughs> She's 20. She's almost 21. Has she availed herself of the apps herself? Do you know? Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to say it like that, but I she's grown up in a household where for the last, oh, almost 10 years, but certainly eight years, her mother has been focused on these issues. She worked on Swipe. She was a, a, ah. a like an assistant producer on, on Swipe, the film. She's a film student at, at NYU, so... She's watched all the footage. She's very well versed in what's going on on dating apps. I mean, I think that, you know, she's a very analytical thinker. And I don't think that she sees it as anything that's going to benefit her. So she's just not interested, as far as I can tell. I think that probably makes sense. So finally, you did meet somebody. I you, did. You did. So after all is said and done, you fell in love with somebody you met. Well, I did, but I mean, that's okay. Yes. Yes, I did. And but that's I, the exception, you think? Well, no, I mean, I think the framing is important. Just because you fall in love with someone that you meet on one of these apps doesn't mean that the apps are good. And just because you fall in love with someone that you meet on there doesn't mean that the relationship is going to be fantastic. I mean, I always tell my young women friends, the end of the rom-com is the beginning of the relationship. You know, like... Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Know, like, you know, dating apps would have us believe that people are riding off into the sunset, but available data from like Pew says that's really not the case at all. But um, I mean, there's just not available data that says these things are leading to lasting relationships or marriage despite right. the lies of the marketing. And yet you sometimes, that's one of the things I talk about in this book, okay, is like, what has happened to the thunderbolt, the 
feeling of seeing someone across a crowded room. I guess for one of a better word, romance. And romance gets a bad rap because it's been so, you know, used in such exploitive ways as well. But there are these feelings that are like, you know, butterflies and they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I did get that with someone. But what I try to describe in this book is how that relationship was so affected by dating app culture and hookup culture. I mean, also, he's much younger than I am, but I tended to date much younger guys. And when I first went on Tinder, there wasn't, there weren't a lot of people my age, really. Now there are. Now everybody is. But it's the thing of like, the app is always there. The phone is always there. You never know mm-hmm. what's really going on. There's no sense of commitment. There's no labels. There's no, it's not that I was trying to marry this person or anything, but I think it's very, very hard to have a relationship in this era in which there's really no trust. There's no, there's like a complete breakdown of trust. And there are all these people, if you've been a veteran of these apps, you know that there's just a whole buffet waiting for you if you get bored with what you have. And I think that's part of it as well. Right. And that just doesn't go for apps. It goes for Facebook and everything. I mean, I write about in the book and a lot of my women friends my age, I'm 56, have told me the same thing, especially they're single. It's that 2 a.m. Facebook thing from some guy who's like clearly married and hitting you up in the middle of the night. And, and you're just like, what the hell? This has really opened up a whole new way of being unfaithful and cheating that I don't think is talked about enough because nobody wants to really admit that it happens. Well, I think it's the beginning of a conversation that everybody should have. And I think just because there's a big chocolate mousse with whipped cream sitting on the (laughs) table doesn't mean you should eat it. I hate to sound like such an old fogey, but I believe I've become an old fogey and I'm owning that. But I agree with so many of your observations about anger and rage and exploitation. And I'm very pleased to finally meet you, Nancy Jo. I'm so pleased to meet you too. Well, Nancy Jo, let's talk about your five things that make your life better because all is not misery and grief. There are still things that make our lives better and that can sort of cheer us up. Oh, At 56, I'm happier than I've ever been. Well, that's beautiful. That's fantastic. And I understand that from reading your book, and I want to hear more about it. So your number one best thing is a place that appears in your book often and always makes me feel like I want to go there, too. Well, you're going to come meet me there for a sake bomb. Okay. Okay, I will. <laughs> and that is, do you want to say it or should I read it's, it? It's Saki Barsatsko. It's on uh, my block in the East Village, East 7th Street. And it's owned by my best friend, who's the eponymously named Satsuko uh, Watanabe. And she and her daughter, Amy, are dear friends. And I think all New Yorkers understand the importance of your neighborhood place. You know, in England, it's like the pub. Mm-hmm. And we whether it's a restaurant or a cafe or a bar or whatever, we live in small spaces and we need to go out to enjoy society, to socialize. And this is my place. And it's just this funky little hole in the wall where the most interesting people wind up, mainly because of my friend Satsuko and how the kind of people she attracts. And I had many, many conversations in that bar about online dating, which you can read about in my book. Right. And I think what I loved about what you said about the bar was that you all became uh, each other's protectors. Yes. Yes, absolutely. When I started to online date, my daughter Zazie had just turned 14. So it wasn't like I had to be at home all the time in the afternoon or the early evening. She was doing her homework or whatever. I didn't have to be there, you know, watching and make sure she was okay, like you would with an eight-year-old or something. And I was online dating and I just like, I had so many things I wanted to say about it and share with people. And I would go in there and it would just be a conversation where I would feel better because, you know, it's like the talking cure. You vent, you laugh, you have a beer, and you can go home feeling like you're not quite so crazy. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Um, Number two, edibles. Oh, edibles. Okay. So a couple of years ago, I fell in the street. I, um, I've always been a pot smoker. Like I don't feel bad saying that now it's legal. So it's not like you have to whisper and say, I'm right. A I've always sort of <laughs> smoked, I've always sort of smoked pot, not like every day or anything, but we call it, we used to call it pot. Now it's weed, but um, right. we called it pot. Yeah, it was pot, but now it's weed. So 
I always sort of partook, but I fell on the street a couple of years ago. I I stepped in a pothole and I fell on my face. I broke oh. I broke my wrist, my nose, some teeth. Got a torn rotator cuff. It was just a lot of healing. It's it's, a, it's actually an accident that a lot of people have in midlife. Um, for whatever reason, you get to be like a dog who can't see in here, and you like bump into things. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But I, I read recently this made me feel better. Thomas Jefferson had the same accident. He broke his wrist and his shoulder, his rotator cuff, and I was like, oh okay. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. If TJ did it, all right. So I mean, you know, there's other yeah. things about him I don't like, but so I was in pain, lots and lots of pain from all the surgeries and recoveries. So I started taking edibles because I don't like to take drugs. And, um, you know, like all that aspirin isn't good for your liver. So I just started taking edibles. And I found that for a type A high strung personality like myself, this was something that I wish I had discovered a long time ago, because it's like you can control the highway more than pot and you just tear off a little ear of that gummy or a little face or a foot mm-hmm. or whatever. You don't have yeah. to take the whole thing. And you just, I don't know, it's like everything's just a little less upsetting. So I love edibles. And as you mentioned, they are now legal in New York. Yeah. Um, well, THC is now legal in New York. Yeah. And number three is your daughter. Well, she changed my life. Of course. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. She saved my life, really. Must be an incredible level of closeness that is different when you are doing it by yourself. Oh, yeah. And and the two of you were just totally dependent on one another to get through a day. Oh, yeah. And it's still like that, especially since the pandemic. I mean, she's been at college. She moved back home, took a gap year. And we've just been, it just feels like she's, 10 again. And, you know, we watch movies, we hang out, we talk about everything. We talk about feminism a lot. You know, we'll pause the movie and say, wait a minute, that was mm-hmm. not okay. And then we'll just like have a real interesting conversation. She's so smart and fun to talk to. I learned so much from her. And um, she makes my life better all the time. And now that she's older, she does stuff like do the dishes. And it's like, wow, I didn't really think about that. Like one day she was going to be doing stuff like that. Like, yeah, suddenly, now she's suddenly actually there, helpful. Yeah. yeah, like suddenly, like there's toilet paper and I didn't buy it, and I'm just uh, like, oh wow, this is cool. Oh, I'm smiling <laughs> so wide, you can't believe it. Um, I get it, I get it. It's nice when your kids are old enough to really. How old are um, your kids? Oh Lisa? my God, they're our age. They're 31 to 24. Oh, wow. Okay. Going in reverse order. So they're adults. So the younger one must tell you about the dating apps. Not that he or she is on it, but they, you know, they must know of them. Oh, they must. They all must. But I no, they don't talk to me about that so much. But we talk about, you know, they're, they're all very feminist and daughters, you have daughters? two daughters and a son, and they are very protective of one yeah. another in that that's, way. That's amazing. Yeah. I saw your bookcases um, just before when I we said hi. And number four is sturdy bookshelves. I have over three thousand books. I know that's it's like a it's become like almost like a fetish. I can't get rid of them. <laughs> I don't think I, I can't. I I love books. I just love them. It's just very hard to keep them in New York. And when I was younger and I had smaller spaces, they would have to be in storage spaces, and that. That's terrible because you can't see them and you need them. And sometimes I think, you know, people say, well, why have books? You can have a Kindle or whatever. But see, to me, it's the physicality of it. And I will remember, wait a minute, I'll be writing something. Oh, wait, isn't, doesn't that writer say something about that? I want to reread that. And I'll go to the bookshelf and I don't know how my brain knows where they all are because they're not in alphabetical order. But then I'll see and I'll pick it up and there it is, you know, and it's like. You remember the quote was on the right hand side. Of the page, you seem to know it's magic. I think there's something about the physical relationship that you have with books that makes your brain intake them more. Actually, it's not just me that thinks this. There's a study that says that when you read something on a screen, you absorb it less than Mm -hmm. from a physical. That makes sense to me. Yeah. So I need bookshelves and they make my life better. And as you know, there's a scene in the book where the hookup, well, he becomes the one that I fall in love with. He actually builds me some bookshelves and I feel like I'm about to have an orgasm right there. For <laughs> right. <laughs> like watching this cute guy build me bookshelves. I just, oh my God. It doesn't get better. It's yeah. better than that. Yeah. 
And number five is your treadmill. Okay, so another thing that you'll read in the book is that when I, you know, I think that one of the taboos, unfortunately, that we don't talk about enough is menopause. And so I try and be really honest and upfront about it and what it started to do to my body and how it changed me and how difficult that was for me because it was hard and I started to gain a lot of weight. And I'm not trying to fat shame anyone. Everybody's the size that, you know, everybody has a right to choose the size that they are. And I think everyone is beautiful, really. But I felt uncomfortable. I personally, that was my choice, felt uncomfortable in the size that I was getting to be. So, and it, you know, it affected my self-esteem and it, it's all those things. And plus you're getting older and I suddenly, my hair is going white in one part, you know, I have like a skunk streak now. So I bought a treadmill. And during the pandemic, I did the opposite of everybody else. I stopped eating so much. I tried to really, I, my whole life, I've just never really thought about calories and never counted calories, which is probably accounts for the reason that I've always been a little chubby in a cute way, I hope. But I started counting calories. I started going on that treadmill every single day. And I love Spotify on my treadmill. I love, I'm such an old fogey. I like to watch old cop shows on my treadmill. Like I'll watch a, mm -hmm. Col I'll watch a Columbo. Yeah. <laughs> Which Adorable. That, was, that was high art, you know. Yeah. And, and um, well, John Cassavetti is Peter Falk, Yeah. Right? So um, he had all these amazing stars on there. So I've started to become more of a size that I, I'm happy with. And it's really because of the treadmill. Yeah, I've done the opposite. I've done the baking, cooking, and eating. But yes, good for you that you do that. I feel better. I I'm feel sure. Better. I feel better. I have more energy. And I just, I got terrified that like, oh God, I'm already, you know, over what I would want to be. I gained about, let's be real. I say it in the book. I gained about 50 pounds, which is a lot of weight. You know and, what? I, one of the things that's very sweet in the book is you keep asking yourself, is this menopause? Wait, is this menopause? <laughs> Wait, is this menopause? And it was. <laughs> well, it was, but you know, you were sort of blindly trying to figure it out. I know because I didn't want to admit it. There's so much stigma around it and there shouldn't be because guess what? You get a lot out of it too. I mean, it's, you it's can part of life, you know, right. you can't yeah. deny it. Right. You know, one of my favorite things I've read recently is that orcas, female orcas, speaking of whales like me, no, <laughs> like us, yeah, Fem like me, like female orcas, well, old female orcas live a really long time and they weren't really sure why. And then they finally realized it's because they're teaching all the other whales, especially the young male whales, how to live. They're teaching hmm. them how to find food. They're teaching them about their pathways through the ocean. They're, you know, they have, they're sort of like the, they have the wisdom mm -hmm. to, to help everybody else survive. And older women become shamans in certain societies and are very well respected. Maybe not in ours, but not in you ours. Know, not in ours. One day, there's, there's terrible ageism, and I've I've experienced it myself. When my 2015 article on Tinder and dating apps came out, it was a, really the first article in a major publication to criticize dating apps. I was called old by the Washington Post. The nerve. Yes. It said, this sounds like an old person's view of Tinder. Oh, no, wait. I'm sorry. No, the Washington Post called me naive. It was Slate, I think, that called me old. Oh, sure. Slate I, would. Oh, I, yeah. Yeah, it called me old. And Washington Post said I was naive. Um, Which is it? <laughs> yeah. I mean... I'm not able to have an opinion on this. Meanwhile, little did they know, and I'm not able to, as a journalist, interview people about this, which I've done for years and won awards. So, okay, none of that is said by these people. are just like, oh, she's just old. She's just old. She's just this old lady. Doesn't get it. You know, and meanwhile, I was having sex probably that day that that article came out with like a 24-year-old that I had met on Tinder. I just didn't write about that in that piece at that time. I guess that's what I'm doing now. Those, that really, that makes me mad. But being mad is part of feminism. Yeah, it is. It really is. And that's part of your book as well. Nancy Joe, thank you so much. It's really been fun talking to you. Lisa, you're the best. Thank you. 
Thank you. Now I get to say you've been listening to Five Things That Make Life Better with me, Lisa Birnbach. My guest this week has been New York Times bestselling author, Nancy Jo Sales, really just a wonderful journalist, talking about her soon-to-be-published memoir, Nothing Personal, My Secret Life in the Dating App Inferno. You can follow Nancy Jo on Instagram at Nancy Jo Sales or on Twitter at Nancy Jo Sales. Her website is called nancyjosales.com. My blog is at lisabirnbach.com. We have the same naming geniuses, I see, uh, (laughs) when we developed our websites, where you'll find links and photos to all the things in this program. My podcast is produced in New York City by thefieldtv.com. My engineer is Kevin Watkins. My team is Espresso Richie, Michael Port, Bucko Haft, and Sam Haft. Until next week, wear a mask and act natural. Bye-bye. That was Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. New episodes every Friday, if she remembers.